good afternoon and welcome to the Institute of World Politics. Um, this, uh, for those of you who are new, IUP is a graduate school of national security and international affairs. We have five master's degree programs, 18 certificates of study, and a new doctoral program. If you're interested in learning more about us, please feel free to speak to one of our staff at the conclusion of this event. Um, today's lecture is the 8th Annual Kosciusko Chair Military Lecture in honor of General Walter Yaiko, and it is sponsored by the Center for Intermarium Studies and the Kosciusko Chair of Polish Studies at the Institute of World Politics. Our speaker today is Jeffrey Soroka, who is a graduate student at the Institute of World Politics, and he is studying international affairs. He has focused his graduate research on Russian Eurasian affairs and has delivered two previous lectures as a part of the Kosciuszko Chair's Intermarian Lecture Series. He obtained his Bachelor of Arts in Government from Patrick Henry College in 2015. Please join me in welcoming our speaker. Hi, thank you all for coming. Um, so as you can see from the title, our focus is going to be on uh, primarily NATO and Russia, um, going into some of Russia's uh, military and foreign policy history um, in order to kind of draw out some themes, not, not necessarily trying to make solid predictions, but draw out themes about Russian behavior because um, there's been a lot of concern in recent years uh, with Russian activities in Georgia and in Ukraine. Um, and with uh, U.S.-Russian relations reaching an all-time low, um, where Russia might look at testing the U.S. or testing uh, the international order next. Um, I'm going to get into that a little bit more at the end. Um, I have the Baltics on there. That's one that has come up quite frequently in a lot of different um, publications and such for the reasons that I'm going to discuss here. I don't believe the Baltics is where our focus should necessarily be. So as I said, um, there's concern because back in 2008, um, although even, even before that in 2006, you had Russia start to take actions against Georgia as it started to try to push for some more sovereignty on its own and even started looking at the possibility of accession to the EU and NATO. You had um, several different uh, economic embargoes and sanctions leveled against Georgia. Um, the conflict that actually sparked off in 2008, obviously there's there's still a lot of discussion about um, who did what, who was responsible. There was an EU report that kind of placed blame on both sides. Of course, commentators on both sides used that to then say, look, Russia was to blame or look, Georgia was to blame. There's still obviously a lot of confusion about exactly what happened. Then in 2014, um, starting more in 2013, you had then President of uh, Ukraine, um, Yanukovych, pull Ukraine back from its efforts to uh, integrate further with the West through some um, economic agreements with the EU, which sparked off some protests in Kiev. Um, they're called the Euromaidan protests because they took place in Liberty Square there in um, they're in Kiev, and they were they were more pro-European. As a res in in the process of those protests, you had several protesters end up being killed, which um, led to Yanukovych fleeing the country. At one point, he even um, abdicated the presidency in some way, and the uh, Ukrainian parliament voted to impeach him. This led to the Crimean referendum, which was widely criticized in international spheres, and also the conflict in eastern Ukraine, which is still going on today. I'm, I, I want to be clear that I'm not saying necessarily that there's some kind of solid pattern in, um, in Russia's activities, not saying, you know, there was so many years or so much amount of time between these two, and therefore we're getting close to that same amount of time, but we are seeing more Russian activities in, in recent years along some of the same lines that they used in these two, in the lead up to these two conflicts. And it's my belief that they're, they're going to be acting more publicly soon. And it's important for us to think about these things for policymakers to look at different ways they might be able to counteract the next move that Russia might make. So we're going to go into the history. I know, um, 
the title was Russian Military History, and there is going to be quite a bit of that. It's not going to be a deep dive into the personalities and all kinds of surrounding events. We don't really have time for that because that would be centuries. Um, but we're going to talk about what I believe are some very important events to remember, and again, try to draw out some themes. So, it's my argument with the themes that we're going to discuss that for nearly all of its recorded history, Russia hasn't been one to start wars with other powerful neighbors. It does get into conflicts, but it often fights battles that it's relatively sure it's going to win. Um, this trend can be seen going all the way back to the time that then Muscovy, which became modern-day Mos Moscow, was under Mongol rule. As the Mongols pushed further and further west, they encountered Kievan Rus, um, which was composed of several different principalities. Many of the western princes within Kievan Rus tried to put up as much of a fight as they could, suffered extensively because of that. Kiev at one point was completely razed to the ground along with several other important cities in the region. You had eastern princes, which were under, um, which were a part of Muscovy and, and the surrounding area. They did fight some battles, but more often than not cooperated and to a certain extent even collaborated with the Mongol rulers. The Battle of the Kalka River there in um, 1223 was... Um, the Battle of the Kalka River was uh, seen as essentially the the beginning of the Mongol rule in the region. Um, and then it, it lasted for, as you can see there, about 260 years. Some historians say that the Battle of the Uber River was about the time that Mongol rule over the region ceased. Some put it a little bit earlier with uh, the, the Grand Prince of Moscow ceasing to pay tribute to the, the Khan several years before that. At that point, you also had the the great hordes split up into several smaller, um, several smaller hordes, and so the, the the grand prince had ceased paying tribute. At the Battle of the Ugra River, um, the grand prince had been harassing several of the other uh, Kievan Rus principalities. They tried joining with um, one of the one of the Khans in the region to fight off the prince, um, and so the the Mongols showed up at the Ugra River where they were intercepted by the Grand Prince's forces. The Mongols expected more forces from Kievan Rus to show up and from the, the Polish-Lithuanian Commonwealth to show up and help them, but they had been stalled by uh, the Prince's allies. And so it's not really a battle, sometimes it's called the Battle of the Ugra River, but essentially the Mongols walked away without a fight. And so that's often pointed to as a point where the the, print, the Grand Prince of Moscow was able to just shirk off what the, the Mongols wanted him to do. However, there's a, um, there are some academics that have studied some of the diplomatic communications between uh, the Grand Prince and the, the Crimean Khan, and they, they see in some of the language that's used, some of the gifts that are exchanged, that even though effectively the Grand Prince was still able to... Um, do what he wanted, essentially. He still showed a lot of deference to the, the Crimean Khan. Um, and so, with that, again, I think that shows from the very beginning of um, what we could identify as Russian history a value placed on survival uh, um, above independence, essentially. Um, I'm not, again, I want to make it clear through this discussion, I'm not in any way drawing necessarily a moral conclusion from that. I'm just saying that it is, it's a theme that we see repeated in Russian history that they often value survival above all else. Um, cooperate, um, deceive in order to get to the point where you can then overpower. Which, while there are other cultures that obviously use that, I think sometimes we have a little bit of difficulty understanding and responding to it in Western culture. So moving on, under the Russian Empire, 
Um, so, since, since the rise of Muscovy, many Russian leaders believed that Russia occupied a special place in history. Obviously, again, this isn't unique to nations. Most nations believe that they do occupy a special place. However, under the Russian Empire, we saw um, back in the 1400s, after some disputes within the, uh, within the Eastern Orthodox Church, the emergence of this idea of a third Rome. The first Rome had fallen, Constantinople became the third Rome. Um, at this point, we saw an idea emerge that essentially Constantinople had fallen, and so Russia became a third Rome. Constantinople disagreed with this idea, obviously. Um, and then moving on in the, this is obviously jumping quite a bit, in the 1800s, Alexander I began to see himself as a potential negotiator and mediator in Europe. You had the rise of Napoleon and the constant battles between Napoleon and the other European powers, and Napoleon had this had his new ideas of how European politics should be run. Um, and Alexander firmly believed that he would somehow be able to befriend and kind of moderate Napoleon and bring him around to a cooperation with other European powers. And he maintained this idea for probably longer than was healthy. Um, eventually, when he met Napoleon, um, he started to come around to the idea that maybe this wasn't the case, and then over a series of a few battles that were that were fought between Napoleon and some of Alexander's allies, eventually realized that he was not going to be able to stop him. Napoleon not only had designs on Europe, but eventually had designs on Russian territory. And after um, the first major battle between Alexander's forces and Napoleon, which he was advised by several of his military advisors to not even go into this battle. Um, he lost it pretty soundly. He and Napoleon signed the Treaty of Tilsit, which essentially said that the Russian Tsar would accept Napoleon's idea of European politics, he would stop acting against him, and he would cease all trade and contact with Great Britain. Which, according to most European ideas of treaties, should have given Napoleon quite a reprieve, he shouldn't have had to worry, um, but pretty much both sides actually fully intended on violating this treaty from the moment, you know, before the ink was even dry. And <clears throat> Napoleon started using this reprieve to build up his forces again, or, I'm sorry, Alexander started using this reprieve to build up his forces again, prepare, he started harassing Napoleon again. Eventually, you know, we see one of the first major invasions of Russia by a European power when Napoleon brought his troops in, expecting that Alexander would meet him on the field of battle. Napoleon was a brilliant military general. He knew that he could win in an open battle. Alexander knew it too, and so, to the surprise of Napoleon, pulled his troops back, continued retreating across Russian lands, giving up territory, giving up cities, even, you know, giving up populations and resources as Napoleon's forces moved across, which in most European minds, especially at the time, a violation of territory was cause for war, and you, you defended your territory. A monarch's power and ability to command was very much wrapped up in his ability to actually defend his territory. And so when, uh, when the Tsar even pulled back out of Moscow, even even allowed Napoleon to enter that city without much of a fight, um, it really highlighted the the difference between the way that the Russians and the Europeans viewed warfare, viewed how to conduct it, viewed what um, what it could be used for. Soon after Napoleon entered Moscow, you know the Great Fire of Moscow started, and there's still some debate about exactly who started that fire. Some believe that Russian partisans actually started it in an attempt to essentially ruin the city for Napoleon so that he wouldn't be able to stay there. Of course, those, those tactics did eventually work in preventing Napoleon from cementing his control over Russia and having to flee, losing most of his army in the process. Um, but again, I, I bring this up as an example of the different views on warfare between 
Western European ideas and Russian ideas as they developed during the time. So, again, jumping ahead a little bit to the Soviet Union during World War II, um, this was this was getting close to kind of the what we could see as the strongest point in Russian military history. Um, it's it's interesting because we still sometimes to this day historians will debate over different European leaders that did not see the the coming um, alliance between the, the the coming treaty between the Soviet Union and Germany, primarily because they were focused so much on the competing ideologies of National Socialism and Communism, um, also looking at the fact that both leaders had talked about designs on each other's territories. Hitler had been very public about his desire to someday control Russian territory in, in Mein Kampf. Um, but this, again, I think that this highlights a bit of a disconnect between Western thinking and especially Russian thinking in not seeing a very cold pragmatism in being willing to set aside even deep-seated ideology in favor of buying time and getting the breathing room that they needed with the full intention of eventually betraying each other. Of course, Germany betrayed the pact first, struck first, which again leads to some of the jokes we see about Hitler not learning his lesson from Napoleon about invading Russia. Um, but again, we see many of the same tactics used when the Nazis invaded in that while putting up more of a fight than the Tsar's forces did, they withdrew across Russian wilderness, burning, um, burning cities, burning resources, pulling out what they could and leaving as little as possible, but in the end giving up much of their territory with the hope of drawing the Germans far enough in that they would eventually wear down, tire out to the point that the Russians could turn it around and reclaim that territory. Um, <clears throat> Again, this, this disconnect in the way that a Western power was viewing war as, I take the territory, I'm winning, um, and that Russian idea of that pragmatic withdrawal and being willing to draw your enemy even across your own territory in order to buy the time that you needed. So that brings us to the Cold War. Um, I would argue at this point, uh, it was the height of Russian military power. Um, World War II was getting close to it, but of course during the Cold War, Russia had several satellites that they could rely on for additional resources and troops. They could use those to fight proxy wars. And then of course you also had them possessing the second largest nuclear arsenal at the time. And I highlight this to say, you know, in, in recent years, people have been more and more worried about Russia sparking some kind of an open war, especially with the U.S. and NATO. Um, although it's not, again, it's, it's not my intention to make solid predictions and claim to know the future, I would argue if there was a point at which they were going to do something along those lines, it likely would have happened in the Cold War. And it, I, I understand there were a lot of different competing political um, and geopolitical ideas but I, I want to bring this up again as a way of saying there's a certain pragmatism to Russian ideas of war and what the end goal is. Um, not saying they're not willing to be in conflict with other countries. In fact, at the end of this, I'm going to be discussing the idea that Russia views pretty much all of international relations and foreign policy as a type of zero-sum game conflict. But warfare itself, open war with a powerful, with another powerful neighbor or, you know, another powerful entity is not how they often engage in um, achieving those goals of theirs. It's often through covert actions, as we see they've used in Georgia, as we see they've used in Ukraine, and have started using in other Eastern European countries. It's through proxy wars. <clears throat> we see it come up sometimes in, um, uh, in, we saw it in the nuclear arms race. We see it in modern day negotiations over some of the uh, some of the nuclear 
arms uh, treaties that are being renegotiated today. So that brings me to the main point. Again, I understand there's a lot of observers that look at look at current actions and think that the Baltics and especially Estonia, I've seen mentioned several times, is a place where Russia might make its next challenge of NATO. Um, there was especially a lot of fear of that recently in, uh, in 2017 with the large military exercises that they engaged in with Belarus. I, I argue here that I, I, I don't believe that's going to be their next move. Um, not to say that it's not something that's on their radar, but I do think the Balkans is something that's not getting as much attention today, especially the ongoing conflict between Serbia and Kosovo, which we're, we're seeing the Serbian and Kosovo governments take some steps towards trying to normalize some of their relations. And there are also, at the same time, some stories about Russian activities towards stopping some of those efforts. There's been stories recently about Putin having a personal visit scheduled um, in Serbia mm -hmm. around the time that there would be a vote on some of the, the deals that the Serbian and Kosovo president have been discussing to normalize their relations. And the reason why I think that presents a good, opportun good opportunity from Russia's point of view to make another challenge of NATO is for the points that I highlight here, um, people have discussed whether or not it was right for NATO and the U.S. to get involved in the Balkans in the first place in the 1990s. Whether or not, um, whether or not you agree that it was right, the fact is right now NATO has a permanent peacekeeping force in Kosovo. Unfortunately, not every NATO member actually recognizes Kosovo's independence, even though they contribute forces to. Um, to that peacekeeping force. I, I bring up four specific nations here, space, Greece, Romania, and Slovakia don't recognize Kosovo's independence. Many, they, they have their own reasons for this. Some of them have taken steps towards recognition. Obviously, political decisions like that don't happen overnight. Um, so again, just making it clear, it's not my, it's not my intention here to call them out for that, but it does, it does provide a, I guess I would say a little bit of a chink in NATO's armor. Because as we saw in Ukraine, Russia is capable of engaging in asymmetric warfare and information warfare in order to stir up um, especially ethnic tensions. And should those be stirred up to the point that it brings about some kind of an open conflict, either through the deaths of protesters possibly paramilitary forces from both sides clashing at some point near the border. You would, um, you would have some NATO members that would support Kosovo in the conflict. You might also have some that support Serbia in the conflict. Um, Romania actually has fairly good relations with Serbia at this point. And that would be especially destructive because one of the main strengths of NATO is its collective defense, the idea that the members support each other. And if such a conflict were to take place in the near, near the peacekeeping force that Kosovo maintains in the region, and um, members of that peacekeeping force were killed, you may actually see uh, the member that contributed the forces that were killed want to trigger some kind of Article 5 collective defense because it was their forces that were killed by a foreign power, probably not triggering it against Russia, but triggering it against Serbia, or possibly even against Kosovo, again, depending on which nation it was that lost the troops. Um, but it's highly unlikely that you, you would see every nation join in that collective defense declaration, which would start to cast a lot of doubt on the very idea of collective defense. It's only been invoked one time in NATO's history, which was after the September 11th attacks, and <coughs> members joined um, in, the other, the other NATO members joined in, in, joined the U.S. in its efforts to, um, to go after Al-Qaeda in the, in the wake of those attacks, and so a uh, test of it, that, a, a more recent test of that collective defense that did not pass muster, essentially, would 
be disruptive because um, there's not enough of a there's not enough of a precedence built up that 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 the collective defense agreement would be able to survive that one that one failure. And that's that's it. <coughs> Questions? Yes, uh, you had mentioned at the beginning, by the way, great job. Uh, at the beginning you mentioned uh, about the relations. I've heard this many times in the press. At the lowest point in history with, with Russia. But, you know, we failed to realize, you know, the missile crisis, that was pretty low. And also in the 90s, it was, uh, we were pretty close to nuclear uh, conflict because of an oversight uh, computer mistake at an early warning station in the Soviet Union. So, uh, just something to keep in mind. It seems it, bad, but it's not as bad as it seems. Right. I guess um, drawing the distinction between lowest relations with the Russian Federation versus lowest relations with the Soviet Union. That's I know true it's, statement. True statement. Yeah, it's, it's a bit of a distinction without a difference, I understand, and it, it also is a bit of a politically charged statement. Um, they're low, I don't think any, but I, I appreciate the distinction. Um, it sounded like one of your assumptions is that it's uh, uh, part of uh, Russia's long-term strategic posture that they are going to continue to nag at NATO. Mm -hmm. That they, to the extent of deliberately provoking them, what do they get out of that versus just keeping things in a stasis? Because I don't think NATO's—they can't be thinking NATO is going to invade them. <clears throat> uh, well, I mean, you—you you do sometimes see arguments to that effect. You have seen uh, public figures and political figures in Russia call out NATO's expansion, especially as there was talk of adding um, Georgia and Ukraine. Um, you know, there are, there are people in Russia and there are Russians that view Ukraine as rightfully their territory. And so to see whispers of Ukraine getting NATO membership, um, some might view, I, I'm, I agree with what you're saying, some might view that as an invasion. I do think, um, and I, I am arguing that it is part of a long-term strategy not to spark war with NATO, but yes, to harass it primarily because Russia wants to um, increase their hegemonic power in the region, um, especially over Eastern European satellites, which, I'm sorry, not Eastern European nations, former satellites, which at one point the USSR controlled. Um, and so, again, it's part of a long-term strategy to harass without actually sparking the kind of reaction that would lead to open war because that would be yeah. contrary to their long-term goals. Thank you. And just for the second question, how about Belarus? I think that, uh, you know, it's, that it's more likely something they, they may take, exert some kinetic action vis-a-vis -vis Belarus. You already see a lot of um, cooperation between Belarus and Russia. They're, the relations between those two countries are much friendlier than Russia has with most of its other former satellites. I'm not... They um, kind of play a double game, though, a little bit. Mm -hmm. Whenever and, they feel like too overpowered by Russia, it seems like they do then turn around and start teasing, you know, uh, NATO. Or, uh, so it, it's kind of an unstable situation. The Belarusian president, um, I don't remember if it's the current one or if it was a former oh, one. So. Oh, Right. Uh, mm -hmm. I'm, but I'm saying, I, I know I read this a few years ago, so I don't remember for sure if it was him or if it was, um, has made statements to the effect of, you know, we don't want to be a puppet of Russia and we also don't want to be a puppet of NATO. And very publicly saying that kind of thing. Um, wanting to, to a certain extent, be a broker between the two. Um, so yeah, you're, you're right. I, which, as long as... I would say as long as Belarus doesn't actively pursue great, um, you know, like EU accession and NATO membership and much stronger economic ties with Western nations and especially the U.S., um, Russia isn't as likely to engage in the same kind of activities that we've seen in, in Georgia and in Ukraine, especially because a consequence of their actions in Ukraine has actually been to drive many of the Ukrainian people um, 
further from pro-Russian ideas. Not all of them are, you know, sometimes it's easy to see things as black and white, either you're pro-Russia or you're pro-NATO. Many Ukrainians still are not pro-NATO, not necessarily in favor of NATO membership, but whereas um, before uh, some of the polls that were conducted saw quite a bit of pro-Russian sentiment, especially in the East, um, the polls that different groups have been able to conduct since the conflict have shown a mark, marked decrease in pro-Russian sentiment in those regions. So as long as a nation like Belarus is willing and ready to work with Russia, I don't think they're going to rock the boat so much with them. And then Mr. Yellow so much in Newfoundland is that I formerly was a researcher with Radio Liberty. Um, first, uh, just as, as a comment about the last about NATO and about the world. Uh, I just read a brilliant piece by uh, a Ukrainian analyst called Victor Rude, who said that this NATO is, that it's a threat to Russia, is a myth. And the Putin and Russians know. This is a myth, but they're propagating this myth to sow discord in the West. It's only the a lot of analysts in the West that say we have to be, uh, you know, we we are the cause of, of Russian belligerence because we expanded to NATO. That's just a, a short cut. Uh, a couple of questions. Uh, thank you for a nice overview of the history of uh, Russian military. It's a really nice uh, summary. Uh, uh, question: Have you read uh, Sayyid Plokhi's *The Lost Kingdom*? Uh, Sayyid Plokhi is a, a Harvard professor uh, who wrote this book uh, on Russian imperialism from 1470 to present. I want, to, some, I, I want to say I've seen it referenced in some of the other works that I've yes, read. It's, it's a must-read. That's all I want to say. Okay. Uh, now, uh, you mentioned the idea of the Third Rome. Mm -hmm. Well, uh, the idea of uh, Moscow as the Third Rome is currently being questioned by what's happening to the Orthodox Church in Ukraine. Mm -hmm. You know, and if uh, most uh, the, the um, Ukrainians want their own independent church, uh, independent from Moscow, and they've asked the uh, Patriarch of Constantinople, Bartholomew, to bring, grant them uh, so-called Thomas of autocephalacy mm -hmm. uh, as an independence. And it appears it's on the verge of being granted, even despite the fact that Patriarch Kirill came to uh, Constantinople, Istanbul, to pressure Bartholomew not to give it to him. But it looks like it's a done deal. This has caused an incredible reaction in Moscow because they're going to lose half, you know. Good portion of their church to uh, to Ukraine, uh, and there's some some talk that this is such a provocative action that they're getting ready to invade. You know, there have been maneuvers with thousands of tanks along the border of Ukraine right now. That this might be a flashpoint that uh, uh, provokes, you know, a Russian invasion. Any thoughts on that? So. Um on all the things you mentioned, or just the last one? The, the last one, the other okay. separate okay. Right. Um, yeah, I've seen the I've seen some of the recent stories about uh, Bartholomew. I've seen his name written so many different ways. Bartholomew, I'm going to say for a second. Um, uh, essentially saying, I'm going to grant the motto Cephalacy, and um, the, I, I saw some kind of a uh, response essentially saying, well, uh, from, the, from the Russian point of view, saying, you know, well, it might happen, and then kind of a rebuttal from um, from the the patriarch saying, no, it's it's going to happen. It's just a matter of time. You know. So um, yeah, they've they've been pushing for it for a while. For a long time, you've had the Ukrainian Orthodox Church Moscow Patriarchate and the Ukrainian Orthodox Church Kiev Patriarchate. Sometimes even my understanding is right across the street from each other in different regions of Ukraine. And there was stories a little while ago about, um, you know, as I mentioned, some of the pro-Russian sentiment reduced as a result of the conflict. You also had um, several stories about somewhere in the order of thousands of believers 
leaving Moscow Patriarchate churches and almost literally just walking across the street to a Kiev Patriarchate church because they were upset about Russia taking these actions in their country and the Moscow Patriarchate leaders would not call out those actions. So I think, personally, I, I'm excited about the prospect of them getting that independence. Um, I'll admit I've tried to look more into um, kind of the structure of the Orthodox Church. I understand the, the patriarch, the ecumenical patriarch is not He's not the Pope of the Orthodox Church, but he does occupy a special place and he commands a certain degree of respect. And there was also um, some stories about in the process of Kirill trying to protest this decision that he's making, he, um, he, he took some small actions which were essentially designed to publicly question Bartholomew's authority as the ecumenical patriarch. And that may have actually you know, encourage Bartholomew to take this decision. Um, some of the internal politics of the Orthodox Church don't always, it, it takes a little bit to for me to understand exactly what's going on there. But um, from what I do understand, I, I, as I said, I'm excited about the prospect of them getting that independence and the Ukrainian nation um, essentially, have, not, the, not the government, but the Ukrainian people having more command over their own Patriarchate of, of the church. Thank you, that, that, that uh, blasted off on, on this. The Russian Orthodox Church was so audacious to put pressure on Bartholomew at that point. The Bartholomew and the Greeks were, have been disallowed visa for any more Russian uh, uh, clergy to come. This is a couple of days ago. To both Turkey and Greece? To, to Greece, but it sends the message. That, oh, okay. uh, and um, yeah, and uh, just a little uh, background on the um, the key the key patriarchate. It, the situation in Ukraine is like this: that Moscow Patriarchate owns more than half of the properties, and the key patriarchate because they, they took over whatever was under Soviet Union, and the key patriarchate has doesn't have so many property, but it has three times as many members or believers as as the Moscow Patriarch. And I have some information for you later on this uh, polling on this. Sounds good. I would like getting more resources. I wonder how you would uh, put like internal strife, uh, this is like the Chechen war, into that and into your broader community. Right. It, it wasn't so much intended as a timeline of modern military history, just kind of setting the setting the pace for you know, why I believe this discussion is important. But as far as the Chechen, um, as far as the Chechen conflict, that actually kind of ties into the first thing that, that you had said about um this this idea that's sometimes presented in russian media that nato is some kind of an existential threat to russia as if it's going to invade um putin maintains power and obtained power by appearing to be a strong man um after the fall of the soviet union russia went through some really difficult political economic and some would even say spiritual times um there was a lot of there, there was a loss of hope essentially um and i i I think sometimes, uh, again, that's something we don't we don't always understand. The the West was um, very happy that the Cold War was over, and rightfully so. I'm not I'm not trying to cast cold water on that, but there was a loss of hope, and Putin obtained power by presenting himself as a very strong leader who would put an end to those times, who would bring back hope, who would bring back both economic growth and strength and respect in the international sphere. And the um, there was a, I'm trying to remember the title of the book, there is there is a work called um, The Rise and Fall of the Soviet Empire by Brian Crozier that goes into a lot of detail at the end of the book, especially on um, that post-Soviet time and the Chechen conflict, um, and talks about how that was used um, 
you know, we could we could get into some of the theories about responsibility, but how the Chechen conflict was used to present Putin as a much stronger leader, and how in more in more recent years the conflicts with NATO are to a certain extent necessary to prop up his image as that strong leader who's standing up to challenge the West, to challenge NATO. Um, am I answering your question or am I getting off? Do you think his success, that definitely was a vehicle for his rise, but is his success there, or lack of success, like kind of a blueprint for what they're, what they're now you see that? Like, you think like from what they're doing internally, what they're just trying to do externally? To a certain extent, as much as domestic, policy and affairs translates into international affairs, some of those lessons learned can obviously be used. Um, not that I think you're saying it's a one-to-one -one comparison, because it's not, but um, yeah, to a certain extent, as much as some of the lessons learned there could be applied, um, yes, that, that idea that, um, again, having a conflict with somebody that is showing Putin as this figure who's willing to stand up for Russia, um, helps keep his popularity high. Uh, how do you see the prospects of military-to-military -military cooperation between NATO and Russia? Are you going to bilateral basis between the <clears throat> NATO allies and Russia? Uh, you mentioned how um, NATO is a challenge to Russia. Uh, is that more on a kind of ingrained strategic level? And is that a real impediment to this cooperation because um, a lot of the achievements of uh, the recent era, like uh, Russian air troopers training in the U.S. and vice versa, the uh, NATO supply border to Afghanistan through Russia, that all happened after the two-round NATO expansion. So the the NATO strategic position seems like a lot of those achievements of cooperation happened after that. So is it more of a is a real impediment to the NATO? strategic layout, or is it per perhaps personalities uh, in the Kremlin or in the West? So, um, first off, uh, not trying to like necessarily call you out, I don't believe NATO is a challenge or a threat to Russia. I think, uh, I mean, you know, you can always you can always say that there could be more cooperation in international affairs. I don't think, I don't think NATO is an existential threat to Russia. I don't think most of the members want to be. I'm not sure if that's what you were saying. I had said, um, but well, um, what about like their perception? Like, do they perceive it as a strategic threat? So yeah, and that's as I said, that's that is a line that is pushed by Putin's regime. Um, so let me let me come back around to the actual question that you asked. Um, as far as strategic cooperation, um, although you can you can sometimes see a bit of a trend line in relations between different countries, um, it's not a straight line. Sometimes you see things improve a little bit. Sometimes you see them fall back, and it, it can be simple things that trigger those. You know, you can you can have what seems like a very small event in a secondary theater some somewhere that either greatly improves or greatly harms relations between two countries. So, sure, you'll see more small instances of cooperation, like you mentioned the joint training and such, because. I think there's always going to be people present within both parties that want to try and find those opportunities. Um, but no, I think it is a matter of personalities, especially um, Putin's and some of the people who, you know, there's there's all kinds of different theories about, you can get into some of the conspiracy theories about like who's actually propping up the regime. I'm not getting into those, but obviously he's not, he presents himself as a strong leader. He's not a one-man show. There are other people. I'm, I'm not trying to say that, you know, as soon as Putin is out of the scene that everything is going to be peace and love, because it's not. There's plenty of other people within the regime that also want to view NATO as a threat because it gives them a way to appear strong. As long as those people are present in the regime, I don't think you're going to see large level cooperation, um, strategic level cooperation between the two powers. I think that it's going to be um, there's going to be competition, there's going to be some back and forth. Um, China has, uh, uh, the PRC, has followed an interesting strategy of having a parallel to the military initiative or strategy, a financial one. 
uh, with the One Belt, One Road Initiative and the AI, AIIB as alternatives to Western financial support like IMF, World Bank, etc., um, AEU membership. Um, has Russia pursued anything like that in sort of a Slavic bank kind of thing? They, they just don't, they, they seem to have only a military kind of strategic view. Russia's, they've pursued their Eurasian Economic Union um, and tried to, as, as essentially a competitor to the EU, um, tried to get several of their former satellites to sign on to that, had marginal success at it. They've mostly, in terms of financial and, and economic warfare, mostly pushed um, their abundant natural resources, especially energy resources. Um, not quite, at, I would say, as subtly as the Chinese. I haven't studied as much of the Chinese financial um, efforts, but from what I've read, again, not pursued it as subtly necessarily as they have. Um, again, primarily trying to use uh, their resources as a way of saying, you know, essentially quid pro quo. You know, we have this, um, you've seen they've, they've been pursuing their new gas pipeline through the Baltic. Um, as a way of essentially, you know, right now their gas pipelines go through Ukraine and in order to, if, if they ever want to cut off Ukraine as they have in the past during this current conflict, um, it also involves losing some of the <coughs> revenue that they get from uh, that gas transit, transiting Ukraine and going on to Europe. Um, they lose their ability to export some of that to Europe. Um, so. So, so the distribution <coughs> channels of their resources. Versus, you know, China is basically lending money through the AIIB to build infrastructure uh, in, in the countries that are participating all along the, you know, the new Silk Road, One Road, One, Road, One Belt thing. And by, by getting into strategic financial, these key massive infrastructure projects, you know, ports and energy and all the rest. They they build a strategic bond as well. There's mm -hmm. a there's a military intent there as well, uh, which is a true of the West also uh, to to some extent. But just as, as you said, it doesn't seem like Russia has the the subtlety of that kind of parallel, you know, layering of how they exert influence. Mm -hmm. So it's interesting. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Oh, I'm sorry. We do a lot of applause, but I have one question. Um, so, overall, as I understand it, you're saying that Russia will continue its aggression to expand influence and then possibly to the national borders in some capacity, but in a way to ensure that it is not engaging in actions that spark a land war. At this point, right. So, I guess. The Western policy makers should the attitude return to a theory of containment, or some or to what is the new policies that Western governments should pursue um, in the face of this? I don't think a containment policy um, similar to what we had in the Cold War would be a good option, primarily because it would essentially confirm Russian fears of an existential threat from NATO. Um, I personally, I think the continued NATO expansion, um, if conducted correctly, can be a good thing. It um, essentially greater international cooperation, bringing more nations into a liberal international order that values sovereignty and values cooperation more. Um, I don't pretend to think that that you know completely eliminates the possibility of conflict that. Humanity has has had war as a part of its history forever, and that's not going to get rid of it. Um, as far as are you asking, like, so no, not containment. Are you asking, like, what would be? Well, so I think that continued policies of want to expand partnerships with nations that border Russia are, in some sense, a form of communication, and that. Those, those policies are partly what um, Russia is inviting 
happens now is that we have to establish this previously held sphere of influence. Um, and I was just curious as, as to what path besides that, is there another way ahead for the Russian government? Well, I would argue that Russia is going to engage in some kind of competition and conflict with NATO and the West, regardless of whether we continue to bring new nations into the fold. Um, again, if if NATO expansion is conducted correctly, it can strengthen the alliance by bringing in more partners. Um, <clears throat> in the meantime, you know, as I said, a conflict in Serbia would potentially undermine the idea of collective defense. In the meantime, while we're while we're discussing whether or not to bring new members in, the various NATO members need to seek ways to reaffirm their commitment to collective defense. Not not calling for somebody sparking a war in the name of collective defense, but continuing with military exercises and continuing with cooperation between the members to strengthen the relationships that they have with each other. Simply being members of NATO isn't going to make everybody best friends, so we need to find ways for the various NATO members, especially the current Balkans members and other members that have a history of conflict between them, find more ways for them to cooperate and um, cooperate and conduct exercises and strengthen their own relations with each other so that that doesn't become a weak point that Russia might exploit at some point. relations with both China and Russia are problems that need to be addressed. I, I think sometimes um, sometimes it's easy to to think like, you know, we shouldn't focus on Russia, we should focus on China, or we shouldn't focus on China, we should focus on Russia. Um, unfortunately, we need to be focused on both, and it's, it's they're both large problems that need to be addressed, and both require a lot more attention by policymakers that already are flooded with plenty of other problems that they have to deal with. So it's managing the resources that we have available. Um, but I both need to be addressed. I don't I don't think that you can honestly say definitively one is more important than the other, to the US at least. Before we close up, I'd like to share uh, an absolutely brilliant Norwegian series about Russia uh, and, and its and mindset and how audacious, audacious and uh, devious they are. It's a Norwegian series called Occupy. You can stream it on, on uh, Netflix. It, they have two seasons right now, two seasons of eight episodes each, and they're working on the third one. It, besides being extremely entertaining, it really reveals uh, a mindset of how they operate. Uh, have, you, have you heard of the series Occupy? Um, I've heard of it. I don't believe I've actually uh, watched it's, it. It's, so. I really recommend it. Thank you. All right. And that will close it out. Thank you for coming.